Test, test, test. Okay, good morning. Welcome to lecture nine of 12. We are getting there, we're almost done. In terms of the book progression, as you can sort of see from the next slide on this, we are entering chapter 3.3. Our goal is to take three weeks to do chapters 3.3, 3.4, and a bridge between them. This is actually quite slow for these topics, so these may feel a little bit boring just because we don't want to go into chapter four this semester. It's not worth it. They, they need the material for next, next semester. And so we're just ending at the end of chapter three. So if that means we kind of rush through it, then we'd actually have two weeks left and we don't want that. So our goal is at the end of week 11 to have finished chapter 3.4, which wraps up the entire content of the course, gives us one lecture to review, talk about the exam, wave our hands vigorously, skip class, do whatever makes you happy. In terms of the rest of the course, assignment nine is up and you have until next Monday. We are going to try and keep rolling the assignments till the very last Monday of term to give you the most opportunities to do well and to get the highest grades you can. Also, the more problems you do, the more you learn, and that should hopefully help. We will post information about the final exam in a little bit. For the moment, we are more concerned with the lab exam. So we are entering, we're not quite there, but we're almost starting week 10. So today's Tuesday. Thursday starts the 10th week of our cycle for our workshops. And that means it's the dry run of the lab exam. Question? No. no. There is no quiz in the workshop this coming week because you need the time to do this stuff. We're still working on how exactly we're going to deal with that. We may just do like we did for number four and just give you the whole week to do it and just do it on your own time kind of thing. Question? The exam being the final exam? For the final exam? Yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely. That's, I, I am in the process of making that. I've just been really busy and I haven't managed to finish it yet. But yeah, I'm going to take every problem we've asked you from every assignment and every quiz and make one giant infinite attempt assignment that you can use for as much studying as you see fit. And that'll be there. So that will happen before the end of term and you'll have that for the whole break. Our exam is actually nicely scheduled and then it's on the 15th. So you have some time to study. So I know you have other exams. I'm not saying study for 12 days or anything like that. But the later it is, the more you tend to have been able to fit little bits of studying in in between the other exams. So it's not you know, on the first day. The exams that happen on the first day of the exam schedule are horrible because you have no time to prepare. So that's the basic plan. The lab exam tri trial or dry run is happening this week. You should absolutely be studying for this between week 10 and week 11. At the very least, unless you're really confident in your abilities and are, you should be preparing your cheat sheet. And I posted details about this already, but I'll say it again because you're all here. You may have open only R for the lab exam. Our studio can be open. That's it. Anything else that's open is an immediate failure. If the TAs catch you with a chat program open or a web browser open, you fail on the spot. No exceptions. No, oh, I was just, no. It happens, you're done. Zero. That's cheating. And if you really want to push it, we'll send it to the dean and he can talk to you about academic honesty. But within our studio, you may have open another tab, another file. And in that file, you can put whatever you want. So that's your cheat sheet. In our studio, you create a big sheet, a big file that has everything you think might be important from the entire semester. Every workshop we did, you have the, the summary of it. Every command we've used, examples, your solution to the dry run can all go in there. Just please be careful and don't copy paste code that doesn't actually work on the data for the exam because then you'll lose massive marks for that. But if you're at all nervous or you want something to kind of just be there that you can look at and go, oh right, I knew how that worked, I just needed a reminder, that's what it's there for. And that is up to you. I mean, you can share with each other what the file is. We're not going to be looking at the file closely. You can literally write paragraphs to yourself in there if you want to. Whatever you want. But it has to live inside that file and it has to be in our studio. No other programs open during the exam. And there will be two TAs who, who only job for 90 minutes will be to walk around looking at your screens. So just kind of be prepared for that. It's a real exam. It's worth 15% of your grade. And so you have to take it seriously. Cheating will absolutely not be tolerated. 
Any questions about that? All right, you'll see the dry run on starting Thursday. Your, your workshops are basically Thursday, Friday, and then like one poor section is, is on Monday sometime. So you'll see what it's like. It's really not intended to be that hard, but it does summarize everything we've done so far. So if you've gone through the workshops and you felt like everything's going great and you kind of understand it each week, you know, you struggle a little bit, you get through it, you figure it out, and then the next week you're like, oh, okay, I'm just building on the same thing, you're fine. Your, your amount of studying should be fairly minimal. If you've been blindly copying things off the worksheet and putting them into our studio for nine weeks and have never managed to actually master any of the material, you are not going to have a good time. And that's why it's an exam. It's testing to see if you've actually been doing the work and staying on top of it and learning the material. So if you have any more questions about that you want to ask privately, feel free to come to office hours or just send me an email or a message on Slack, and I'm happy to chat about that. But you'll see what it's like this week, and then we can talk next Tuesday a little more before your actual exam starts the, the following Thursday. Yes, question? Sorry, what was the first part? Okay, so, so you, you seem to be a bit confused about what the lab exam is going to be. It's nothing like the assignments. It is an implementation of a lab report. You will be importing data. You will be <laughs> organizing that data. You will be performing a hypothesis test on that data all in R. You will be doing the simulation method we've talked about multiple times through the semester in R, and then you will be creating a plot. Now, within that framework, obviously, there's a lot of wiggle room for what I'm going to throw at you, right? I can use any of the models we talked about so far in the semester. And in fact, I can give you different models based on which section you're in so that people can talk about what they actually did during their lab exam. So I can give you anything from the semester within that framework. But it's not going to be a word problem that you have to do the math on. It's all in R. And, and the, we've been building up through the semester. You notice that the, the workshops have been kind of building on each other, and every week we add new concepts, but then we're doing a little more. The goal was building up to this point, where you put it all together. So that's why I go back over your workshops, go back over what you learned. Hopefully you'll find the first six weeks feel easy now. Look back at them like, wow, that, that's actually not so bad. I, I, I can do that. And it's just have to put it all together. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. As long as, as long as it's you know, very clear, that it's an exam and we got very tight space. You know that room, 50 people kind of cram right in there. But yeah, you can have your laptop and like a little bit of paper to work out math or whatever like that. But you can't bring any notes in, except for the file inside our studio, which admittedly lets you bring in infinite amounts of notes. You just have to type them. So, all right, let's get started on the lecture. We've got a fair bit of slides to get through today. Today is a new topic and a new distribution, which is quite different to everything we've done so far. And this is a unit that normally just gets shoehorned into a random section of the course. So like often it happens in the second semester, sort of halfway through when you finish one topic before you start the next. But it fits pretty much anywhere once you understand the basic ideas of how hypothesis test works and that distributions exist and that there are these things. Now, the vast majority of everything we've done so far in the class has been normal. This week breaks that paradigm. So we are going to do something different this week that has a genuinely new distribution that you may have never seen before. Now, if you've taken a stats class before, you probably have seen it. But assuming this is your first stats class, you'll never seen the chi-squared before. So this is the chi-square, or often said chi-squared. And there's no real agreement on which way that is. Chi is a Greek letter. It looks like a fancy x. And the distribution is squared. Hence, it's chi-squared. Statisticians are original. Okay, so, so this is exactly what it says it is. What is this? It is the distribution of things like variances. And so we, we've talked about the distributions of means, and we've had these normals that are shown up, and next semester you're going to introduce the T distribution and some other variations that are all kind of hump-shaped, central, unimodal distributions. There are a lot of other distributions in the world. This is one of them, and this one comes in when we are testing goodness of fit which is how well does the data that I've given you fit an assumed distribution? And your test statistic is a chi-squared statistic. Let's talk about how this works using our motivating example. So uh, Walt, Walter Frank Raphael Weldon, or just Weldon is how I'm going to refer to him, who died in 1906. He was an evolutionary biologist. He founded Biometry and was a joint founding editor of the journal Biometrica, which is one of the world's preeminent journals in this in this area, along with Galton and Pearson. Galton will show up again next semester. 
He was also a uh, I get sort of a statistician. Technically, the field of statistics didn't exist when they were doing their work, but they were doing statistics before it really was a thing. So they were the, um, the first hipsters, I guess, in the statistics world. They were doing it before it was a thing. In 1894, he um, was bored, I guess, and he took a single a set of 12 dice and rolled them 26,306 times and recorded what he got. You got to remember this is well before computers, well before any of these things. They were exploring the concepts of randomness and how randomness worked. And statistics was predominantly a field which had evolved out of gambling. And it was probability that, that talked about how gambling games worked and were used in the gambling houses of Paris and France to set the odds, to determine what your win would be if you rolled a certain set. So if you're playing craps and you rolled a seven, what did that do? And so they were working through these. But a lot of these things are assuming that the dice are fair, which is to say that all of the sides show up with equal probability. So if you roll a dice, you get a one with the same probability as a six. And if you've ever played Yahtzee, you know that actually sixes don't show up when you want them to. But in general, they're supposed to be random. So he recorded a five or a six. So he just said, is it a five or six? Record. Five or six? Record. Five or six? Record. And then he published a little paper on this. And it was observed that actually you got more fives and sixes than you would expect by chance. So fives and sixes are two out of the six sides. So you would expect to get a five or a six, one in every three rolls of a single die. And so if you roll 12 dice, for 12 dice, you would expect to get one third of 12, or four fives and sixes on each roll. And when he added them all up, he found he got more than he would have expected just by assuming these were fair, random dice. His hypothesis, working with Pearson, was that this was due to the construction of the dice, the way they made them. Because he just had some random dice that he had around his house that he had bought for playing games. And the most inexpensive dice have little pips in them. You know, like the type of dice that come in a Yahtzee game or you know, any game you buy from Milton Bradley. They have little pips that are hollowed out and then painted black. And he hypothesized that this was because opposite sides add to 7. That's true across the whole dice. So 6 is on the opposite side is 1, and 5 to 2, and 4 to 3. That the heavier face, the face with 6 pips, is heavier than the 1 pip. And he basically hypothesized that basically, or lighter rather, and the die will actually just end up coming up with the side that has more hollowed out things in it, because that's a little bit lighter, and the heavier side that has less hollowed out things comes down and pulls it down. That was his hypothesis for how it was going to work. So that's the setting of our problem today. In 2009, a gentleman who is a faculty member at the University of Chicago repeated this experiment by making a little dice-throwing, pip-counting, computerized machine, because nobody's going to roll 23,000 dice unless you pay them. So he made a little machine that would do it for him. And it took about 20 seconds to do. So he took a dice, and he rolled it, and then he took a picture of it, and then he used computer vision methods to figure out how many up-facing pips there were, and then he figured out what the dice were, and he counted the dice. It took about 20 seconds, so he did about 150 of these a day, um, and each image uh, had you know, a number of dice in it, and so he was... He repeated the entire experiment in about six days and had a computerized record of the data. So this is the setting of our problem, which is how do we determine when data like this, whether or not it matches our assumed distribution, which is we know how dice are supposed to behave. We're supposed to get one over six out of every times so however many samples we have, ones and one over six times n twos and one over six times n threes and so on until we get all of our rolls. How do we check to see whether what we've gotten is similar enough to that that you would not expect it to be different uh, statistically? So here's the actual dot plot of his overall probability of these three rolls. And he found uh, he didn't actually record just five sixes or not five sixes. He actually recorded what it was. He said, okay, this dice was a one, this dice was a two, this, and so on. And what he found was that the ones and the sixes were well above what you'd expect by chance, 
and the two, three, four, and five were well below by chance. So he gathered a lot more data on this and recorded the pips, and that's what we got. So obviously that's not exactly one over six, even across the board. It's not a uniform distribution. The question is, is it different enough to a uniform distribution that we buy that this didn't just happen by chance, and if Labby repeated his entire experiment, maybe twos and threes would be higher this time, and this is just randomness. And this is kind of, every hypothesis test we've done so far has been essentially in this vein. Just in this case, we're explicitly testing whether it fits and matches a specific distribution. So, he rolled 12 dice 26,306 times. If every side is equally likely, how many times would you expect to see a 1? Which one of these options? So it's how many 1s? And since they're equal, that's the same as how many 2s, it's the same as how many 3s, it's the same as how many 4s. So, 1 over 6 doesn't make any sense. Because that's saying that he would roll the dice 26,306 uh, 26, times and get one over six ones, which doesn't make any sense. And the same goes for this. Does this make sense? This says he would roll a single die 26,306 times, and one over six of them would be ones. But that's not what he did. He rolled 12 dice. 26,000 times, so we want 12 times 26,306 divided by 6. And so our answer is 4. That's how many we expect to see of each individual face on this set of dice. So we expect to see 56,612 ones and 56,612 twos and so on. So this tells us we had over 300,000 dice faces. Here's the actual observed counts from Labby's experiment. So we saw 53,000 ones and 53,000 sixes and 52 and change of the twos, threes, fours, and fives. Now the expected, this is where we get the language of this type of test. We have the observed which is literally what you observed. It's the data. It's the thing that came from the experiment. And then we have the expected, which is if the null hypothesis is true. So that's what this is. If the null is true, what do we expect? And in this case, we are assuming fair dice. We're assuming that a 1 and a 6 come up equally likely as a 2, 3, and 4. Yes? Sorry, where am I looking on here? Probably because I can't do math. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just check that. <laughs> it's entirely possible that I just typoed that thing. Uh, so let's take 12 and multiply that by 26,306 times and then divide that by 6. And this should indeed be 52. Thank you. That's a great catch. So yes, th that number should have matched up with the number on the next slide, and I don't know how I missed that, so thank you. So 52,612. So you can see, under the null here, we're assuming a 1 over 6. So you take the number of rolls, and you multiply it by 1 over 6, and that's how many 1s you should get, that's how many 2s you should get, and so on. Please note that it is OK to have a fraction here, to have a decimal. You can expect, if we, if we rolled 9 dice, how many 1s would you expect? You don't round that. You keep that at 9 over 6. It just happened in this case that he very carefully did an exact multiple of 6 so that everything worked out, which is why he rolled 12 dice. So you had the multiple of 6 built in there. So this can be a fraction. So when you're doing the assignment this week, just be careful on that and don't assume that you have to round those because that will throw your whole answer off. So those can be fractions. Those can be decimals. 
They don't have to be round numbers. It's just what you would expect given your number of samples and given your assumed distribution. And our assumed distribution here is a uniform one. It's the same. One over six, one over six, one over six, one over six. Now, you can see the discrepancies here. Those are not the same number. Those are not the same number. I mean, none of them are the same number. We didn't get exactly what we'd expect, but that's how randomness works. You can flip a coin and get 50 heads in a row. Low probability, but it can totally happen. But it's rare chance. If I roll 52,000 dice, do I expect to get exactly that number? No, of course not. There's a little bit of variation. So the question is, is this variation enough that it's a red flag? That we go, wait a second, our assumed null distribution is not really working here. And that leads us to our new test. Uh, so why are the observed counts different? Well, so basically, does there appear to be an inconsistency? That's just what I was saying. So this is the setting of the hypothesis. Do these data provide convincing evidence of an inconsistency between the observed and the expected counts? That's what this test is designed to do, is to compare your observed and your expected. And that's all it does. So it only works on one set of data and one distribution. And lecture 11, 10 and 11, we're going to talk about what happens when you break that and you start talking about two things at a time. It's called a two-way table. But in this case, we're just dealing with a single set of data and a single distribution. Do the data provide convincing evidence of an inconsistency? No hypothesis, as always, is that there is nothing going on, nothing to see, move along, move along. Nothing here, which means there's no inconsistency which means it matches the assumed null distribution. So you have to be careful with that one. It's a subtly different logic to what we've been used to, where the null is, is that it's zero, not a number, typically, for some of our mean questions. In this case, it's that the distribution is equal to the assumed null. You have no evidence to suggest otherwise. And your alternative is obviously the flip of this, which is that actually, the observed counts do not follow the expected distribution. They're not the same. There is something going on. There is something to pay attention to, and we would reject the null hypothesis. And so in this case, if we found an alternative, if we, if we sided with the alternative, small p-value, all that stuff, we would say, actually, these dice aren't equal probability of getting all the faces. You have a higher probability of getting these two faces for a reason which is undetermined, because stats isn't explicitly science, it's a tool for science, to figure out what's going on, you would actually need to explore the actual dice and hire a mechanical engineer and do a very, very careful gravitometric thing and find out why it is that it seems that those two faces are the ones coming up more probably than the others. All right, let's talk about how you do this. So just as a reminder, kind of we talked about this before and we'll keep talking about this next semester. In statistics, bias is a very specific protected word, and it means the tendency to over or underestimate. In the case of this experiment, the bias is the tendency of these rolled dices to possibly show not the same face that you'd expect. In other words, to show one more often than the other. That's a bias, or a six, or whatever. Just, just a language thing to remind you of how that works. So to evaluate these hypotheses, we want to quantify how different those things really are. And we need to do so in a standardized way, just like we've been doing all along, because it doesn't make sense for us to just take the absolute difference and say, well, look at that. That's 1,500 different. That's clearly important. If you have a 1,500 difference, but you had 100,000 samples, that is less significant than if you had a 10 difference in 100 samples. The size of your sample matters. If I flip a coin 9 million times and I get slightly more heads than tails, that's kind of irrelevant. But if I flip a coin 50 times and I get that same slight difference, I might have 49 heads and one tail. So the size matters. And so we have to worry about when we're quantifying how to standardize these things so that we can talk about them on the same scale. Large deviations will provide strong evidence, but these deviations need to be standardized with respect to the size of your sample. And this is called a goodness of fit. 
the idea here is how well or how good is the fit of the observed data to the expected data or the expected distribution. And if it's a good fit, then null hypothesis. There's nothing going on. And if it's a bad fit, alternative hypothesis, there is something going on. This is not a good fit. Therefore, this distribution is not actually how this data behaves. So reminder, going back a few weeks, this is what we've been doing essentially since the midterm. Break, point estimate, minus your null, divided by your standard error. And last week, the confusion was strong as people basically missed the whole lecture point and, and were just trying to do like formulas that made no sense. This is a formula, but then you have to put in the right pieces for the right values of your problem. So your point estimate changes from problem to problem, and your standard error changes from problem to problem. And identifying the appropriate spot to use those is basically the point of the course. Because the computer does the rest for you. But identification of which one is appropriate, that's a human's job. So if this is the general form, the idea here, typically, and what we've done so far, is to identify the difference between a point estimate and an expected value under the null. That was why we took originally our point estimate minus our null hypothesis. And then we standardize by using the standard error. So we're going to do the same kind of thing, but it's not going to be in quite in this form because we have a bunch of different data points now. Usually we aggregate all our points together and we say the proportion is this, and then we compare that proportion to the null proportion. This time we actually have six different values which we can't really merge together in a way that makes any sense. So you have to do the difference, this statistic, for each one of your categories. Do it for the one dice, do it for the two dice, do it for the three dice, and add them up. So this is our test statistic. Chi-squared test is the sum across your categories from 1 to k, however many categories you have. As I note, k is the total number of cells. These are the categories. This is what we will use k for for the rest of the term. So if you see k, it is referring to the number of categories, and it is an important parameter to keep track of. And what you do is you add up O minus E squared divided by E. And that is observed minus expected, then square the result, then divide by the expected value to standardize. So this is your standardization. This is observed minus expected. So we would go down those six categories, and we would take the O value, what we observed in Labby's experiment, minus the expected value of 1 over 6 times 315,000, square that number, divide by the 52,000 number, and that's one piece. And we would work our way down and do that six times, and then the sum of those is chi-squared test, which is your test statistic, which then you compute the p-value for. This is summation notation, just sort of a reminder how that works. When I put this down, this means take the sum from 1 up to k of O minus E squared over E, which means work through the categories one at a time and take the first one and do O minus E squared over E, do the second one, O minus E squared over E, and so on. Add those all up. That's your answer. And so this is what it would turn into is you say take the O1, the first category, minus E1, square it, divide by E1, plus the second category, same thing, third category, same thing, all the way up to the last category, the kth category, which in this case, for Labby, is 6. Uh. That's how you do it. It's a bit tedious, but not hard. And the nice thing about this one is you can't screw up the standard error because it's just E. So you just, there's, there's no variation in this. It's always the same formula. So once you have your observed, you figure out your expected, and the rest is just autopilot. Question? Pardon me? 
there is, I will show you in a few slides. Yeah, absolutely, you can do this in R. You can create a vector of your observed, a vector of your expected, and then it's one line. That's unfortunately, yeah, how we have to do it this year. Uh, you do have to, on the exam, use a calculator. So it's just we, we don't have the, the system in place to be able to let you use laptops yet. I'm c trying to come up with a system that's going to let it work because, you know, I use R for everything. Like, I have to dig my calculator out when people come to my office and need help with something. And I'm like, I, uh, where is it again? And it's in a drawer somewhere because I just used R for everything. And I want you to do the same because it's there and it's a tool. But we had the technology, there's too many ways for you to have Wi-Fi and connections to things and, and tether off your phone in your pocket while you're in the exam. And, and people will do this. You know, people cheat. And so opening the door to all of that is something I'm not quite prepared to do yet, even though I really would love to, because I think it's the fairest way that we could do the exam. Um, you were talking about, like, that's the point of the like, yeah. Are you do that? Just got to get the lab exam out of the way. But yeah, so by week 12, by the time I post that big assignment, I'm also going to show you kind of what you get. Okay. And that'll be kind of what you work from for the whole, okay. for the whole study. So don't worry, we still got some time before the end of the term. Yes, yeah. So K is the number of categories or bins or potential outcomes is, a, is another way of saying the same thing. So when you roll a die, you got six, right? That's it. If we were talking about digits, which is the last example of today's lecture, how many possible digits are there at the start of a number? So any number you want. You, you give me a number. How many different possible starting digits, first digits are there? There's nine. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So K would be nine in that case. And it's, it's always very straightforward from the question because in a question like this, we have to give you the distribution. Because you, you, you can't know the expected just magically. It has to be provided, which means we have to tell you how many there are, and you'll have that many O's and that many E's, and then it's really obvious what K is. Because you don't know what k is. This is a general formula that applies for any k. And so it starts with 1 and then 2. The question is, where does it stop? You need to know what k is. And so we keep going until we get 1 less than k, and then k, and then we stop. But k could be 6, k could be 9, k could be 20. But if you don't, yeah, if you don't know that, then when do you know when to stop? Well, you do know that. That's, that's kind of the point, is that all of these problems, k is provided. It's really obvious from the problem. You can't do one of these without being given the context. It's just not possible. So the only way we could ask you a question that didn't give you K is if we were asking you about the theory of how these work, like what are the conditions under which it applies and things like that. But if I'm actually asking you to compute a chi-squared test statistic, K must be given in the problem. There's no way around it. So you will know it. It's just it could be anything. And so we have to give a general formula that works for all. All right, let's start putting this together. So this is how you would do it. We have outcome one. I rolled a one. We observed 53,222 ones. And we would expect to see 52,612 ones. Take O, subtract E, put brackets around it, square it, and divide it by E. On your calculator, pretty much any calculator you want, you can do this using the brackets all in one line. So if you have your calculator with you and you want to try, please feel free. That's what it should work out to be is 7.07. .07. Do use those brackets or you're going to end up getting a wildly crazy number. As a rule, these values are all positive. So if you see a negative number, you screwed something up, stop, do it again. You made an arithmetic error. And they're usually between 0 and about 15. So if you see a number like 50, do it again. You probably did it wrong. If you see a number like 1,500, you definitely did it wrong. Do it again. General rule of thumb is that the sum of all of the different values should be somewhere between like 2 and 20. So if you're seeing a single one that's bigger than that, you probably did something wrong. So just stop, you know, check yourself and go, whoa, okay, hang on. Let me do this one again because I don't, I don't believe this. 
So when we do this, we take 53, 2, 2, 2. We subtract 52, 6, 1, 12. And, sorry, 6, 12. Square that number, divide it again by 52, 6, 12, and we end up with 7.07. .07. So that is the standardized discrepancy of rolling the ones. Do it again. 4.64 is the standardized discrepancy of rolling a 2. Do it again. Rolling a 3. Rolling a 4. Rolling a 5. And rolling a 6. Now notice, the ones that to the naked eye looked the furthest away are also the ones that give the biggest discrepancy values. The 1 had a value of 7.07, .07, and the 6 had a value of 8.61. Those were the ones that looked the biggest and the furthest away from the expected, and they gave the biggest standardized numbers. That's what you want. That's, that's normal. If you see one that looks really close and it gave you a value of 12, you probably did something wrong. You switched two digits somewhere and you typoed it. So just look for that logic and go, OK, big to big, small to small, small to small, small to small, big to big. OK, I think I did this right. I trust this. Let's put it together. So we take all these things, and we add them up. So this is the sum from 1 to 6 of O minus E squared over E. Take those six numbers that you've just computed and add them up. This is your test statistic. This is equivalent to Z from last week. So once you have this, you are done the test statistic phase of the problem. And this week on the assignment, we have a bunch of boxes that say, what's the test statistic? It's that number. And then we proceed to say, well, what about the p-value? And that's what we've been doing all along, so it shouldn't be surprising at this point. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about why we did what we did. So why did we square those values? Why didn't we just take O minus E over E? What does the square do? Well, the square, sorry, more rhetorical because the answer is right there. But thank you. I, I appreciate people contributing. I really, really do. It's really easy to come to class and just sit there quietly, never raise your hand, and never, never interact. So you know, I really appreciate the, the questions and, and the answering of questions and so on. It's good. What do they do? It changes all the negative discrepancies to all be positive. Because otherwise, you can have a negative discrepancy in one die and a positive discrepancy in another die. And when you add them up, they cancel. Instead of keeping track that they're both different, you end up with nothing. So they all need to be the same sign. And we standardize by being positive because that's just easier to work with. So everything needs to be positive. And so when we square it, negatives turn to positives. In addition, it amplifies the bigger discrepancies. When you square something, the bigger you get, the even bigger the square gets. And so when we square these discrepancies, the ones that are bigger contribute even more. And it also leads to it being distributed according to the chi-squared. Where have we seen something like this idea before? It was very, very quick, but we have seen it before. Other way, but yeah, yeah. Variance is a square. And we talked about why variance was a square. And it was because we wanted to talk about a standardized metric that was non-negative. And so we squared it to do that. And it also amplified one point being way out. Remember, this is like week one, week two. We had those dot plots. And when you have one value way out, the variance just blows up. Because that one big discrepancy gets squared. And then you really keep track of it. So if you don't remember that, first two lectures have some details on that, but it's just kind of, we've seen this idea before, and we will absolutely see this again. It comes up multiple times next semester in different distributions that we talk about. The idea of squaring discrepancies is extremely common in all areas of math and statistics, and it's done for these reasons. And in addition, for anybody who took high school calculus, it's also done because it makes derivatives nice, and derivatives are actually how we derive these things in the background of what's going on here. So if you're ever to take a mathematical version of this course, not like a, a non-calculus statistics, but a calculus statistics, we'd actually show you how that derivation worked. But in general, squares are done for those two reasons, plus calculus. And we just kind of we use them everywhere because that's how it works. All right, let's talk about this chi-square thing. Because we need a p-value, but we don't really understand how chi-squared works yet because you've never seen it before. So the chi-square distribution, we want to take the statistic we computed and see if it's unusually big or small. Because really, at this point, you have no real context to know what's going on. Is 24 huge? 
Well, if it was a Z, absolutely. You've all seen the examples on web work where you get a Z that's eight, and you plug it into R, and you're like, give me the P norm. R and R's like, uh, zero. Or it says 1.065 times 10 to the minus 27. You're like, that's basically zero, R. Yeah, yeah, but it's not quite zero, but it's really, really small at eight. So what would a 24 be? R wouldn't even be able to compute it. It would say, this is zero. What are you doing? That's silly. But what about a chi-squared? We don't know how they behave. So we don't know if that's big or small. That could be small for a chi-squared as far as we know. So let's try and figure out how this works. Chi-squared distributions have a new concept that we haven't seen really before this semester called the degrees of freedom. And so when you are dealing with distributions, they always have parameters. You're used to that. So remember these parameters. So for the normal, there's two parameters. And you've all typed p norm and q norm into r enough times to know what they are. What are the two parameters for a normal? The mean, the center of it, and the standard deviation, which we write as mu and sigma. So a chi-squared has only one parameter, not, not multiple. And that parameter is called df for degrees of freedom. And that changes the shape, the center, and the spread or the variance of the distribution. That one parameter is all you need to describe the whole way the shape behaves. So given that one parameter, you can actually draw pictures. Well, R can draw pictures for you of what it looks like. So, so far we've really only seen one continuous distribution, which is normal, which is unimodal, symmetric, and two parameters. We will see a bunch more by the end of the year for those who are sticking around for 1052, but this is really your second real continuous distribution. It's only the second one we've seen. And this is what some of them look like. So, got to look carefully at the picture, but the blue line that starts up at the axis and just drops smoothly, that is a chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. Remember, that's all the parameter. You give me a number, I give you a chi-square. There's one unique chi-square for each degree of freedom. Then we have the green dashed line, which goes up a little bit, humps, and then comes back down and tails off. That's four degrees of freedom. And then we have the red dotted line, which goes up, humps, but is much smoother than the four, and then goes back down again. So given this picture and given these three, and me promising you that these aren't specially chosen to be tricksy, these are just three random numbers I picked and plugged into R to make a, the picture, which of the following is true? Or false, actually, I, I've got it flipped. Which of the following is false? So as the degree of freedom increases, does the center of the distribution also increase? Remember, the center is basically where the hump is. So the hump looks like it's sliding over because we've got somewhere at like basically here, then here, then here. That looks increasing to me, right? It's moving up. So that one is true, so we're gonna leave that. The variability of the chi-squared distribution increases as well. So variability is how spread out it is. And if you look at the blue line, the blue line goes down to zero and is basically zero by the time you get to 10. The green line takes until around 15, and the red line goes all the way up to, I can see the dots all the way as far as 25, if you stare closely. That looks like it's correct as well. Does the shape of the chi-squared distribution become more skewed less like a normal as the degrees of freedom go up. No, that's backwards. As the degrees of freedom go down, it becomes more skewed. As it goes up, it actually gets more and more like a normal. And this is a pattern that you will see again next semester with the t distribution, where as the degrees of freedom increase, it becomes more and more like a normal. So that's the correct answer there. So. Let's find some areas under this. So p-value is a tail area. We've done this in normals for four weeks now. And hopefully it's sunk in. We started in week six, and we've just kept going ever since. We've been doing p-norms and q-norms every week, every assignment, every workshop. We've just been hammering it home. And hopefully at this point it is starting to click. So what do we do? We take the test statistic, and like I said last week, we go toward the closest tail. Now, 
there is a special rule here that's a little bit different to normals, which is that when you're dealing with chi-squared, we can use technology or a lookup table, but chi-squared is always an upper tail. For the purposes of this course, unless we tell you otherwise in a very special condition next semester toward the end, everything you'll see this semester, every chi-squared you see, is always one-tailed upper tail, which means you always go from your test statistic up to the right. Now, if you're doing that for a normal, what command would you plug into R? 1 minus the p-norm, because p-norm goes to the left. So you would do 1 minus to go to the right. Somebody take a guess, if you have the slides in front of you, that's cheating, about what the function in R might be that would give us the area under a chi-squared curve. Given that we've used p-norm and q-norm, what's the logical thing they would have called it? P chi square, Q chi square. And it's not quite square, they cut it off at the Q. So it's P chi squ, SQ, and Q chi squ. But it's exactly the same setup, same way you've been doing the P norm and Q norm. The only difference is, whereas in the P norm and Q norm, you had to specify the mean. You had to say, my mean is this and my standard deviation is this. For these, we have to say, your degree of freedom is this. So, while we could use a lookup table, it's not 1980, and I am not going to teach you that. It is a waste of your time. If you're really super curious, it's in the back of the book. Have fun. But just, do, just use R. And this is how we would do it. We would call P chi square. Great intuition. And as we go for the rest of the semester, we have a T distribution next semester, starting in week one. What do you think it's called? PT. We have dozens of other distributions, and in R, every one that's implemented for your use is P distribution name. So the binomial distribution, P binome, Q binome, PT, QT, P chi squ, and so on. It's all the same setup and the same syntax to make it easy to use. This is how we would do it. We'd say, I want to compute for Q equals 30, Degree of freedom equals 10, and lower tail equals false. Now, this one you do have to specify. You can do it the other way if you want, which is 1 minus that thing. But this one actually has something built in that basically just says, I want you to move up to the right. Just do that all in one call, and don't go messing around with me trying to do 1 minus and getting it wrong. You can still do it the old way. You can do 1 minus the, the, the lower tail version, like we do in PNORM. But you don't have to. And so if you had a Q equals 30 and degrees of freedom being 10, then this would be what it would give. Now, where are these numbers? These are just randomly chosen numbers. Please don't try and generalize them. These don't mean anything. This would be if we had a test statistic of chi-squared test being 30 and K being 11. And I'll talk more about why it's 11 in a minute. So that would be a, another example entirely where those were the numbers. But now that we have this, we can use it to find the p-value for our problem. So back to the dice. Do these data provide convincing evidence of an inconsistency between the observed and the expected counts? Our chi-squared test was 24 and change. Hypotheses were, there is no inconsistency, nothing to see. Move along, move along. It's all the same versus the alternative, which is that actually there is something to see. There is an inconsistency here. These things don't match. It is not a good fit. And so it's goodness of fit. The null is, it is a good fit. The alternative is, it is not a good fit. And so take this. Let's find the p-value. This was our chi-squared test. We need the degrees of freedom, and we can calculate the tail. And as I said on the previous slide, the way it works for goodness of fit tests is that the degrees of freedom for your p chi square call is equal to one less 
than the number of categories in your problem. So we had six dice. So this was six. So DF would be five. Number of cells, number of categories, number of bins, minus one. So for dice outcomes, K is six, degrees of freedom is five. Put this together, use R, say R, my test statistic was 24.73. My degrees of freedom is five, and I would like an upper tail by which I'm saying don't do the lower tail. Save the step of doing one minus, just put it into the function call. My p-value comes back, and it is 0 0.0001579. Is that a small p-value? Yes, it's a very small p-value. I, I trust everyone's kind of got their head around that idea by now. We've been, we've been trying to just basically keep using that idea so much that you have no choice but to learn it. But this p-value is small which means this value is way out in the tail, which means this is an extreme value under the null, which means this is not a good fit. Question? It only has the one, one function argument, which is the lower. You have, you have to do the, either that, or you can just leave that one out and do one minus and it works as well. Same as you did with Pinor. So it's, it's, it's up to you if you'd like, you can also run one minus the p chi square of 24.73 and 5. And that will give you the same value. So whichever one makes more sense to you, if you're used to doing it with the p norm and you just want to keep doing one minus, go nuts. That's totally fine. But if you would like to do it using this method, that's also fine. All right. So at a 95% significance level, the conclusion is... We do reject the null. This is not a good fit, which means the dice are biased. Because the null hypothesis is that there's nothing to see, and these dice are not biased, and they all have probability of 1 over 6 of coming up. And we said, eh, not really. Data do not support that. In fact, they provide convincing evidence that we're so extreme under that condition that something's going on. The dice are biased. You will notice I did not say ones and sixes happen more often than they should because I don't know that. All I know is that in this particular data set, I saw more ones and sixes than I would have expected by chance. You cannot generalize that. You cannot say for all dice everywhere, ones and sixes are happening more often than you would expect because that's not true. There we go. So turns out, so he was curious, right? He's a scientist. This is where he did the follow-up study, and he tried to figure out what's going on. Like, why is he seeing this? Turns out, when you measure the dice that he used using a micrometer, everybody knows what a micrometer is? Maybe? Micrometer, as in very, very small. It's a very, very, very precise ruler, basically. It's a machinist tool. You can measure the thickness of something accurate to a ten-thousandth of an inch. Or even further, if you pay a lot of money for an extreme thing. And they're stored in these nice padded things that close. And so they have their own little padding that you place them back into when you're not using them. And they have a lid to protect them because they're worth like 500 bucks each for the good ones. I was looking at buying one actually for my shop. And it was $320. I went, eh, I'll just measure it with a ruler. He used one of these though. And he checked it. And it turns out that when you measure the axis, the sandwich between the one face and the six face, very slightly shorter than the 2, 5, or the 3, 4 faces. Which means when it's rolling, it's more likely to land with that axis up and down because that's the way the momentum works, which is why he saw the 1s and 6s more often. Had nothing to do with the pips, just had to do with the fact that these were cheap dice that he bought for 5 bucks at Walmart made in China. And, you know, they, they weren't really machined to be real cubes. So, um, Casinos kind of care about whether dice are fair. And, you know, if you've ever been to a casino or ever gambled, um, they switch those dice out very often because they don't want people, like, having a bit of sandpaper in their pocket and just rubbing it a little bit just, just to get an edge, you know, or switching the dice for their ones from home that they very carefully manipulated to come up sixes all the time. You know, so those dice are taken care of all the time, but they have to absolutely be fair. And gambling commissions 
will randomly do a spot check where they'll come in and they'll just grab some dice and take them from them and they'll go test them. And if they come back different, they're in big trouble. The fines are millions of dollars. So what do they do? They use very carefully constructed polycarbonate where they make the pips in a mold from a polycarbonate and then they fill all of the pips with the same poly colored white and flush it off so that the entire thing is a consistent uniform density on all sides and there are no holes and it is a perfect cube within some sort of tolerances. So that you'd have to roll one of those dice a million times to see a bias of any sort and they swap them out every like 20 rolls and throw them in the garbage. So that's how casinos get around this problem. Of course, when you're playing Yahtzee, the next time you lose, you just can tell your mom or whoever you're playing Yahtzee with that it's clearly because she bought cheap Chinese dice and they're biased towards sixes and she kicked your ass because of it. It's a simple problem, but it was interesting. This, again, just a reminder how the p-values work. We go from our test statistic. This is a, a generic chi-squared. And we go up, and that is our p-value. And remember, in the, in the workshops, I actually showed you how to create this plot or plot just like it. And so if you want to, you can create one of these for yourself um, by using the same techniques. And it is instructive if you're at all uncertain about what's happening. You know, why does the p-value of this thing come back? You can create a little block of code that will create the plot, show you the chi-squared test, shade in the thing. And you look at it, and you're like, oh, OK. I buy it now. I understand what the shape is doing. Because it's not symmetric. And so you have to be careful. Like the, the p-values aren't quite as intuitive relative to kind of the way they're shaped as they are for the normals. All right, what about conditions? Every test we've done all semester has conditions that are built in. You have to have things that are true, otherwise it doesn't work. Condition number one, every case that contributes a count to any one of the cells has to be independent of every other case in the entire table. So I roll a die. That needs to be independent of the next roll of the die, of the next roll of the die, of the next roll of the die. There can't be anything that is related to those things. When you have your data that you're trying to do your goodness fit for, they need to be randomly sampled elements from an overall set, or they need to be experimentally set up so that they are independent samples. Which is why Labby put so much work into making the machine that would throw them the exact same way over and over again, and he got his randomness off the way they bounced. Because there's always a bit of error resistance and stuff like that. Sample size. To make this work, this is the really important one for chi-squared, every cell must have at least five elements in it, five counts, in expected value. You can have one where you don't get any sixes on your rolling of the dice. That's fine, so long as you expect under the null to have at least five of them. And really, this, this kind of means that, you know, depending on how many cases you have, you need to do a certain number of cases before you can do a goodness of fit. In our six cases for our dice, to get expected values of five, we need to roll the dice at least 30 times. And any less than, we'll have less than five expected cases in each cell, and it just stops working. And degrees of freedom must be greater than one. So this is k minus one. So k minus one has to be at least two, which means you need at least three cells to make this make sense. Always check these. If you don't, then the result isn't actually re reliable, and you end up with a case where you don't actually know whether that p-value is actually accurate because your degrees of freedom may be off, or it may not be distributed chi-squared, even though you think it is. So these are the three things that you check. And there's a couple of problems on this assignment that are just asking you to kind of like, do you understand how these work? You know, like think about this. Is this yes or no, true or false? Do the multiple choice. Check off the rules. All right, let's take a look at another example. So in 2009, there was a national election in Iran, and there was a lot of talk in the Western media about there being fraud during this election. And so we're curious, based on some data that we observed and the reported percent, to see whether or not these two are the same distribution. So the reported number is the final counts, and the observed number of voters in the poll is on the left. Which one's which in terms of how we do this? 
doesn't actually strictly matter which way you go. You can make one of them the expected, the other observed, or vice versa. But in our case, we're going to set the observed number in the poll, and we're going to compare this to the reported number of votes. So our assumption is going to be, because there's two ways this, this could go, our assumption is going to be that our reported number of votes is our null distribution. That's what we assume everything's going to match. That's our expected values. The observed number of voters in a poll is going to be our data. And that's then O minus E. We got that sorted. And the reason for the discrepancy, you have to be careful, can either be because your poll wasn't randomly sampled and so it's biased and doesn't match the votes. This happens all the time where you do, you do polls like the, the exit polls in the 2012, sorry, the 2016 US election didn't match the vote counts in some states because people lied about who they voted for when they left the booth and did the exit polls that people were like, hey, hey, you know, who did you vote for? We're just trying to keep track to get a sense. And they're like, oh, yeah, I voted for Hillary, totally. And they didn't, or vice versa, right? And so those didn't match up. So it could be that that, that poll was bad, or it could be that the poll was right and the reported number was fraudulent. Both of those are possible routes. We don't have a causality path to know which one is which, just that they're different. So this is our setup. Now, this is pretty common. You're given your expected in percents. So what do you do? How do we convert percentages of categories into expected counts? Uh, I mean, I could divide it by 100, and then I get proportions. But what would I do with the proportions? Which you, you can do this. It's okay. But you're not quite done. So if we have proportions or percents, it doesn't really matter. How do I convert this into counts? Close. We have percents for each category, and we're definitely going to relate it to the observed. You're right. But what do we use from there? Observe total. Because these are percent breakdowns of the total. So that's how you put it all together. So we would take 0.6329 times 504. And that's how many counts. Remember, counts are like, I'm counting, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So how many people out of the 504 should we expect to have voting for a Minijibab? I can never say his name right. So apologies to anyone who knows. <laughs> Knows his name properly, you can correct me later. And that is the reported number converted into counts. Do the same thing for Musavi and for the minor candidates. And this is, uh, this is actually the um, presidential election results. Not the party results. Hypotheses. No hypothesis is always, there is nothing going on, there is nothing to see, there is no difference between these two, the fit is good. Alternative is the flip. There is something to see, there is something going on, the fit is not good, or the fit is bad. All right. This is how we do the conversion. Take 504 people, which is how many people you surveyed. How many of them would you expect to actually vote for, given the national? We have 504 times 0 0.6329, 319 people. 0 0.3410, 172 people. And 0, 0261 is 13 people, which needs to add up to 504. You did it wrong. Now, I've rounded these. It does throw it off by a little bit. You can leave them as two decimals. Just again, they have to add up to the same number. Now that we have this, setup is done. Test statistic. Observed. Minus expected. Square the result. Divide by the expected. Plus second category. Plus third category. Add them all up and get your chi-squared test statistic. First one, 338 is our observed number. So we have 338, and then we have 319. 
We take those two, observed minus expected. We square the result, we divide by the expected, and we get 1.13. That's number one. Now do it for two, and then do it for three. Second one, the discrepancy in the standardized form is 7.53. And the third one is 22.23. We're like, okay then. That's interesting. And so we have a very large discrepancy because we expected to see 13 people given the national count. And in fact, we saw in the exit polls 30 people who voted for the minor candidates. Or at least said they did. We don't know which way the bias is going. Put this all together. This gives us our chi-squared. Our subscript here is indicating the degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is two, because we had three different candidate categories. K minus one is two. And so we take that, we plug it into P chi square. We have 30.89 at two degrees of freedom and upper tail, please. And our P value is 0 0.00000196. Is that small? Yes. So we do have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Our observed and our expected do not match. Does not necessarily mean there was fraud. It just means they do not match. So what is the conclusion? The p-value is low. We just, sorry. So we can get rid of the p-value being high. 0 0.00000196 is very, very small. And that means we reject the null, so that one goes away. And it's a bad fit. Rejecting the null means a bad fit, which means they do not match. So our solution is number one. All right, so that's the end of the second example. Now simulating it. We've talked about simulations for quite a while. We've been doing them over and over again. To simulate it, we can do the same thing, but the setup of the simulation is actually kind of different. In everything we've done for the simulation boat so far, from our very first example on day one, when we talked about gender bias, and we had 48 cards, which represented the, the, the promotions and not promotions, and we did the males and females in separate piles, here, you could sort of do that, except the way you distribute them into the piles is a little different. And so the easier way to kind of set up a simulation like this, or at least one of, because there's multiple ways, is to actually use the assumed distribution in order to do the simulation. So you take the null hypothesis and you simulate from that null hypothesis. So, motivating example to show you how this works. Benford's Law. This is our last example for the day, so we will end a few minutes early. Um, but here's the context of this. So imagine you take uh, a database of completely random numbers. So something like all of the front page newspaper entries. You just take every number on the front page of the newspaper for a year. Or you take the street addresses of everybody in this room. Or of eminent scientists. It doesn't really matter. So well, let's just quickly check this. What was your street address when you were growing up? 24. What about you? 2512. Yourself? Did you live on a street? OK. Apartment number or anything like that? Did you have a number associated with your address? 44. Eight. And so you can see, I could go through, I could get all of these. So stuff like that. There's nothing, like you people have nothing in common as to where you're from and where you live, and what the street address was like in the city. And maybe you lived in a place like Briarwood, where all the names were very carefully chosen suburbia names. Or maybe you live in a really older section of the city, where all the names are old English kings and queens. Anne Street, and George Street, and you know all of these things. And every Canadian small town has like six or seven streets. There's a Victoria Street. There's an Elizabeth Street. There's a George Street. We've got a George Street in Peterborough. You know, the, because we just named it after British royalty, because, you know, rah, 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 British. So if you did that and you took the street numbers and just took the first digits, 
Or if we took baseball statistics and we just scrolled down the column and it was like hits and ERAs and all these things, and we just took the first digits and so on and so on. These are completely random numbers that have nothing to do with one another. And we made a big database out of them. If we were to plot a relative frequency distribution, which is to say take all the numbers we have and take all the counts of how many ones and twos and threes we had, divide them by the total. So it's just the percent. It's the proportion of ones, proportion of twos. If I were to plot that, what do you think it looks like? Do you expect to see the same number of numbers, number of numbers, starting with a one as you do a two, as you do a three, as you do a nine? Or do you expect there to be a difference? And if so, what do you expect that difference to be? What do you think? Same or different? These are completely random numbers chosen from our world. Same proportion of ones as twos as threes or different? Take a stand. You don't have to say it out loud. It's okay. But what do you think? Well, what's your intuition tell you? That's what it looks like. Ones happen at a much higher rate then twos, then threes, then fours, all the way down to nines. Now, there are exceptions to this. If you take retail prices, those aren't random. There are far too many nines in retail prices because they take $100 and it's $99.99, like as if we, we haven't figured this out after 40 years of retail that it's $100, especially in Canada where the tax isn't even included, so it's $113. But if you take retail prices, they do not follow this curve but all the rest of it does. And this is something that was discovered by a man named Benford, and it's just one of these occurring laws which has to do with the way we construct numbers in base 10 and the way it rolls over from 99 to 100, and then you've got all the same numbers again, but starting with a 1. 101, 102, 103. And so when we take our street addresses, we are far more likely to have a street address starting with a 1 then we are a nine. So let's just, let's just kind of play with this. Take the street address where your parents currently live, just to kind of make it clear, because you know you may not have lived at home for a few years. Your parents, where do they currently live? One, starts with a one. That's a pretty big proportion. What about twos? That's smaller, nines. See, it happens. It's weird, but it happens. The actual formula that describes the distribution of these digits is a logarithm base 10 of 1 plus 1 over the starting digit x. You do not have to memorize that. I will never ask you to regurgitate it. It's just where it comes from if you're curious. So this is actually a logarithmic decay. And what it does is it gives us very specific numbers which should be the first digits of a randomly selected set of data. So we can use this in forensic accounting to detect fraud. So we are looking for a dastardly thief at Trent who's stealing from the department budget. And we get 355 leading digits from budget line items from the last year. So these are just things, you know, the department bought chalk, the department bought markers, the department bought a new computer for one of the professors, the department bought, 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 bought. And it's the whole budget. We have 355 line items. And we take the first digit of all the numbers on the line items. And we write them down. And the question is, do these digits obey Benford's law? So I promised I'd show you how to do this all in R to make it fast, which I will do. And you can, if, you're, if you kind of sit down and you've got one uninterrupted hour, you can basically blast away this whole assignment. It's a fast assignment this week. So, and you've got still till next Monday, so you've got all kinds of time to do it. You create a vector of the observed numbers that you're given. And then you need a vector that is the same length as that, which consists of the expected numbers. So if those were given to you in the question, you'd just create another vector and you just type them all out. But if they weren't given you, to you in the question, you can create them. So for the example with the election, we could take 504 times our proportions. 
And in this case, we can take 355 line items times the Benford Law proportion distribution, and that'll give us the expected number of counts in each of those bins. And the first one is around 30%, and then it drops down from there. That gives me two vectors. And now I'm going to compute the test statistic just for this value. And so I take observed minus expected, I square it, and I divide by expected. Now the way R works is that when you take two vectors that are the same length and you combine them using an arithmetic operation, you've got to cast your mind back to the first three weeks of workshop, it does it component-wise. It matches them up. It takes the first one minus the first one, squares that. Second one minus second one, squares that and so on, which makes a new vector on the top. And then when you divide by expected, again, same number of elements, first element, first element, second element, second element, third element, third element, ninth element, ninth element, which makes another vector. Except that vector is now O minus E squared over E. And you add them up by using the sum operator. One line does the whole problem for you, computes the test, and the value is 2.523567, two and a half. So that's our chi-squared test statistic. And then since you're in R anyway, and you're going to do it this way, your next line is to take a p chi-square of that. And so I take my chi-square test here, and I just move it in. I use it because it's code, so it knows what that variable is. My degrees of freedom, I still have to specify. You could if you wanted to. This could be the length of observed minus 1. 9 minus 1 is 8. Lower tail is false, and I get my p-value of 0 0.96. Now, please be careful here. Please be careful. That's my p-value. Is that a small p-value? Don't go taking 1 minus. Don't go doing crazy things. That's the p-value. You're done. Even though it says 96, which sort of is like 96%, you're kind of good. You're tempted to turn it into a confidence level. I know you are. It's not. It's a p-value. And you just solve for it, and you're done, because that is big. And our conclusion of a big p-value is fail to reject the null. This is a good fit. Let me show you one picture. Why is this such a big number? Well, because it's like way away from the upper tail where it would have to be. So that's the end of chapter 3.3. Next week, we're going to start with simulations on it, and then go on to 3.4. Have a great week, guys.